Hi guys, Olive here, here today to do a very exciting video, one that I've been looking forward to doing for a really long time. Today I would like to tell you about my top 10 favorite nonfiction books, at least as it stands right now. As I connected to each of these 10 books in very disparate ways, I decided not to rank them. So in no particular order, here are my top 10 favorite nonfiction books. The first one being Quiet, The Power of Introverts in a World That Can't Stop Talking by Susan Cain. This is a book all about introversion what it is, the conceptions and misconceptions of it in society, the myriad of ways that introverts are necessary in today's world, even given the preference shown towards extroverts in the Western world particularly. I found this to be a life-changing book, not only for the value that Susan Cain places on the introvert's style of thinking, but also for her discussion of the tendency of introverts to be highly sensitive people when it comes to external stimuli versus emotion. This book explained so much about my own life and I really appreciated the spotlight that Susan Cain put on the need for balance between introverts and extroverts in this world. This is an essential read for introverts and extroverts alike. The next two books on my list are both by the same author and those are Nicholas and Alexandra and Catherine the Great, Portrait of a Woman, both by Robert K. Massey. I have talked ad nauseum about my love for Russian historian Robert K. Massey on this channel. I have really enjoyed all of his books on Russian history, but these two are definitely my favorites. I read Nicholas and Alexandra when I was in college, and I give this book loads of credit not only for turning me into the Russian history junkie that I am, but also for inspiring my honors thesis. This is a superb biography of the last Tsar of Russia, Nicholas II, and his wife, Alexandra. This book serves as my most recommended book to anyone and everyone who reaches out to me looking for a good place to start with Russian history. I always recommend this book because it reads like fiction. The story of Nicholas and Alexandra is equal parts tragedy and love story. While Nicholas and Alexandra was the first biography that Robert K. Massey ever published, Catherine the Great is his most recent biography and unfortunately will probably be his last considering his advanced age. Massey's writing is absolutely fantastic and paints a vivid portrait of Catherine the Great as a woman, not just an empress. If you would like to hear more about either or both of these two books, I did a whole author spotlight on Robert K. Massey and I will put a link to that video in the description box below. The fourth book on this list is Moonwalking with Einstein, The Art and Science of Remembering Everything by Joshua Foer. This is a romp of a nonfiction book about Joshua Foer's fascination with memory competitions and morphs into his own endeavors to train for a memory championship. Along the way, Foer discusses what memory is, where it resides in the brain, and the different methods that these memory champions use to memorize huge amounts of information. This book is intensely readable, memorable, and the reading experience of it was one of the most enjoyable of all the nonfiction books I've ever read. The next book on this list is Selfish, Shallow, and Self-Absorbed, 16 Writers on the Decision Not to Have Kids, edited by Megan Dom. This is an essay collection in which 16 different writers discuss the idea of not having kids and the different reasons why people might go about making that decision. Given that more and more people are making this choice for their lives to go child-free as it's known, including myself, I found it very valuable to hear about how these writers came to that decision or had the decision made for them by the universe. I think it's important to note that this book is not a slam on children or parenthood. Most of these writers and I really like kids and have the utmost respect for parents, but for the reasons that each author outlines in their essays, they determined it wasn't for them. I took a lot out of this book because it is tied to one of my life choices, but I really do feel that anyone could gain insight out of this book, whether you want kids or not. If you would like to hear me talk more about this book, specifically within the context of the declining population trend in the Western world, toward the beginning of my channel's history, I did a dual book review of this book and another book, and I will link that video in the description box below. The next book on this list is H's for Hawk by Helen McDonald. This book was an unexpected hit when it first came out. I read it and really liked it, but it has stuck with me in such a huge way that it absolutely belongs on this list. Helen McDonald, always an appreciator and trainer of birds, made an abrupt, somewhat perplexing decision to attempt to train a goshawk, one of the most notoriously difficult birds to train, after her beloved father unexpectedly passed away. This is her account of that experience, a highly literary combination of nature writing, memoir, and biography, as Helen McDonald is 
mirroring her own goshawk taming tale with that of writer T.H. White in his own book, The Goshawk. This book is unlike anything I've ever read before or since, and the quiet power of the prose has echoed in my brain since the moment I finished the last page over a year ago. Plus, this book ignited my own interest in birds, which has grown rather fierce over the past few months in particular. So if you read this book, which I highly encourage you do, be forewarned, you too could end up spending your birthday meeting a bird of prey with childlike excitement. The seventh book on this list is The Poisoner's Handbook, Murder and the Birth of Forensic Medicine in Jazz Age New York by Deborah Bloom. Similarly to Moonwalking with Einstein, this one has stuck with me because I enjoyed reading it so damn much. This book manages to be a true crime book, a micro history on poisons, a history of how forensic science grew into its own field, and a discussion on the societal and political impacts of prohibition all at once. How Deborah Bloom so effortlessly managed to cram all of that into a very reasonably sized book, I will never know. But what I do know is that it is a rip roaring good time. The next book on this list is being Mortal, Medicine and What Matters in the End by Atul Gawande. I read this book after the death of a family member earlier this year. I had been putting it off for the inevitable time that I would need this book, and unfortunately that time did come. This is a book all about aging and death, how we treat the elderly and our sometimes aggressive approach to end-of-life care. This is a touchingly written yet instructive read that made me see the importance of having honest conversations with your loved ones about what you would want the last years of your life to look like should things come to that. Having open conversations about death certainly isn't easy, but this book made me see just how important it is. This book even goes so far as to give a list of questions to ask your loved ones so that potentially difficult questions that they may not be able to answer themselves if things come to that have answers. So not only is this a moving book, but it is one that I plan to keep on hand when not if I need to seek its counsel. The penultimate book on this list is Mastering the Art of Soviet Cooking, a memoir of food and longing by Anya von Bremsen. Like H is for Hawk, this is mostly a memoir, but it really mashes together a few genres. This book chronicles the author's experience growing up in the Soviet Union up until the age of 10 when she and her mother emigrated to the United States. She tells her story of being a child in the Soviet Union and then an immigrant in the United States, all with a culinary bent. Von Bremsen does so because she is a food writer and has always had a passion and curiosity for food. In this book, she also discusses a good deal of Soviet history, not just about food and cooking during the Soviet era, but also politics. Everything she talks about in this book is told with such an amazing sense of humor that I still remember nearly word for word all the jokes she told in this book. And the final book on this list is The Soul of an Octopus, A Surprising Exploration into the Wonder of Consciousness by Cy Montgomery. I credit this book along with H is for Hawk for getting me so addicted to books on natural history. I can also draw similarities between this book and H is for Hawk because on the surface they both seem to be about just the animal in the title, but they are both so much more than that. This book not only gives amazing details about the physical and cognitive abilities of these remarkable creatures, but also does some serious soul searching. At its core, it asks a serious question of the reader. What does it mean to be alive and have a connection with other living things? In this book, Montgomery seeks out encounters with wild octopuses as well as those in aquariums. And she makes connections not with just the sea creatures, but with aquarium employees as well as fellow enthusiasts there to meet the octopuses. She bonds with several of the octopuses, seeing a few of them through their entire life cycle, which includes, unfortunately for a few of them, their deaths. I was so incredibly moved by this book. It's the first and only nonfiction book to ever make me cry, and that is a big feat because I am not a crier. So those are my top 10 favorite nonfiction books as it stands right now, but who knows, maybe I will find a new favorite during this year's nonfiction November. If you've heard about any of these books, if you've read any of them, or if you now would like to read them now that you've heard me talk about them, I would love to hear from you in the comment section below, or you can find me on a variety of different places on social media and the links to all of my profiles are linked in the description box below. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you're having a wonderful day and I will see you in the next video. Bye.